welcome back. Yeah, I am Professor Jim Conrad from uh, uh, the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. We're going to talk about introduction to computer engineering. Of course, don't forget, engineers have senses of humor, right? Ah, yeah, I knew you guys would laugh with a serious laugh, I bet you. All right, so I was talking a few minutes ago about how microprocessors are the central part of a lot of processes, a lot of machines, um, a lot of devices out there. Well, think about this. Um, microwave ovens. By the way, you, you press a keypad, right? And it has a display on a microwave oven and it does an, a functionality. Anytime you're going to see some sort of input device and some sort of output device, it typically will be an embedded system. Uh, automobiles. Automobiles have a, uh, what we call a, uh, an engine control unit inside that controls a lot of the uh, uh, functionality, uh, firing of the pistons, also it, uh, it keeps track of things like braking and uh, <laughs> Uh, lights and any other uh, of the many sensors that exist on your automobile microprocessor. Game systems, phones, cameras, uh, the Wii U, in fact, uh, that uh, projector up above is a embedded system because it has a, a processor in it. Uh, that camera recording me back there has it. Everybody has a computer in their pocket and wow, this, this room probably doesn't have that many really visible. Oh, this display itself is uh, itself an embedded system that has an embedded computer in it. So if you think about your typical home, there's a lot of them all over the place. Uh, was it this class or somebody saying that uh, their refrigerator had one? Washers, dryers, uh, uh, of course uh, all electronics like uh, um, televisions and audio systems and VCRs and DVRs, et cetera, et cetera, all have embedded microcontrollers in it. You imagine all the products out there, it seems like it would be a really, really uh, popular and prevalent field for people to get into. Mm, something to think about for you double E's who want to work in uh, entertainment, right? So we're going to distinguish what we call embedded systems from general purpose systems. And, and a good example, I see a couple of you have on your desk some laptops. Hopefully not looking at emails and uh, uh, stuff like that. Oh, are you looking at the, uh, at the slides? Man, I'm, I'm impressed. So uh, Tejas will tell me for sure if they're really looking at it, right? Ah, they are. Thumbs up. The um, distinction between general purpose, a good example is going to be the PC where uh, you could run you know, Microsoft Word, Excel, uh, a browser, a whole bunch of different applications. It doesn't have one specific task. All the way on the other side over there, think about a printer. Can you edit Microsoft Word documents on a printer? No. Can you do that on a, a power meter? No. So in the embedded field, there are specific purpose applications versus on a PC where there are uh, just general applications. All bunch of different things can run. Somewhere in the middle is nowadays uh, mobile phones and tablets because, you know, it used to be in the old days, a phone made a call. It might browse the web. Nowadays, it could pretty much do anything, right? You could edit documents on it. You could, you know, put a whole bunch of different applications. So that would be the cloudy line. But there are plenty of examples of uh, embedded systems out there that, uh, that we can see. And, and one of uh, the definition is a microprocessor based device has a specific function. In other words, as I said earlier, uh, that projector can't do Microsoft Word files. You can't edit it on those. It specifically is to project images that are fed to it. Some of them are special. You can actually download the picture to it or download the PowerPoint uh, presentation. But in general, it has one specific thing that it does. And the applications that are running are permanently or semi-permanently on the device. So how many times do you, uh, do you take your phone and you boot it up from a hard drive? Uh, not too often, right? 
or for that matter, the, uh, the automobile. How many times do you uh, hit the reset button and the thing will uh, spin the disk and pull in the operating system? Usually those, uh, an embedded device has software inside that's always inside and very often you rarely change it too. And typically it's a part of some other piece of equipment that may have previously been very mechanical. So uh, uh, a good example of this, an automobile. Back in the old days before they had engine control units, an automobile was almost entirely mechanically uh, driven. There was an old, in the old days, if you know what, it, you know, there was electricity, sure, and the electricity would be around when a mechanical instance was uh, given. So anybody who uh, worked in old cars know what a, a distributor is? Yep. So back in the old days, rather than a computer saying, fire a piston, fire a piston, fire a piston, that's what gives you the engine or the, uh, the power in the engine, there was a little metal lever that would go around and say, fire, 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 and it would do this in a circle, which was amazing that uh, uh, the things lasted because that's a lot of wear and tear because mechanical systems usually fail first, not electrical systems. So good thing you're in electrical engineering and not mechanical engineering. Ooh, I'm gonna catch some grief for that, I'm sure. So the reason why you would uh, send or have something developed to be more uh, computer engineering or have a processor inside, well, reduce cost, increase functionality, improve performance, increased overall dependability. And a good example is my wife has a new automobile that will tell us when it is time to change the oil. And uh, for the first year we owned the vehicle, it told us we had to do two things. Number one, one of our tires was way, way, way low on, uh, on air. So I took it in and they said, ah, you need a new tire because this one has been literally, uh, it, it took a nail and it couldn't be repaired. And the second time was after 12 months, it said it's time to change the oil and just do general maintenance, which is pretty amazing that it is sensing all the parts of the car and telling me that this car, after only 12 months, or after 12 months and 12,000 miles, needs service. So it, uh, it helps actually save money in that way because I only have to uh, go in and have it serviced once a year. So if you're going to design a microcontroller into a system, and by the way, I, I will use sometimes the words um, microprocessor and microcontroller interchangeably. There is a distinct difference. One is that a microprocessor is a device that does calculations, and it doesn't have a lot much other than uh, the ability to do calculations. It usually doesn't have memory or too much memory. As opposed to a microcontroller, which is a specific device and on a, on a single chip, it will have uh, memory, it will have analog interfacing parts, it'll have digital interfacing parts, it'll have communications parts, all built onto one single chip. And the reason why that's pretty important is because if you're building these extremely low cost um, devices, so for example, this is an amazing computer on my wrist, right? And it, has, uh, and it has a processor in it, and the processor has, on the chip itself, it has extra memory that holds the program, because this doesn't boot from a, uh, uh, from a hard drive like you see most of the PCs do. And when you have a microcontroller, you have to add on some power supplies and the heartbeat of any digital system, which is a clock, and then you can make your, uh, your device like this, right? So by the end of class, we're gonna make that. Yeah, you, you know what that is, right? You, you've seen Star Wars, right? This would be episodes, was it in one? Yes, it was in one. Uh, one, two, and it might have shown up, shown up in three. And of course, everybody knows those are the ones that sucked. Um, and I said that on tape too, yes. All right, so let's go down to the basics. How are we going to represent digital data 
as opposed to analog data. So uh, we're going to look at data in a computer as just the presence or absence of voltage. All right? You've had physics before, right? In high school. And so, you know, we're going to look at V equals IR later and, and stuff like that. But it's important to note presence and absence of voltage. So depending on the microcontroller you work with, it could be three volts and zero volts or five volts and zero volts, but it'll be presence and absence. And based on that, we're going to make a lot of um, circuits because not only we're going to use one and zero, but we're going to put a whole bunch of those ones and zeros together. Uh, now, the one and zero is uh, in our world called a bit, a binary digit. And you've already heard that phrase before, right? This is nothing new. So let's look at, uh, oh, putting together a bunch of bits. Oh, the one thing I should mention too, remember I said presence and absence of voltage? Well, sometimes we give it a fudge factor, meaning, all right, if our one is up to five volts, then we'll accept four to five volts for a one and a zero volts or a zero to one volts for the logical zero, all right? So from now on, let's just worry about zero and one, all right? By the way, we could put those, we could put two of those together, two of these bits together to have a, a bunch of different possible states. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Easy enough, that's only four. And oh, if you take three, you have a possibility of, you have eight possibilities. And if you have a collection of, of n, then you have 2 to the n, all right? So what I want to do is I want you and make for me the following. And uh, I believe we can see this uh, uh, screen over here. So those at home can figure this out. Wow, this is a horrible eraser. So is that, so I don't think I'm going to do well. All right, so imagine this. We're going to work with number systems, and primarily we're going to work with three types of number systems. Well, you're all familiar with digital, right? So if I were to uh, tell you, give me the digital, I should say digital, uh, I chose the wrong word there, decimal. <laughs> decimal because you have what? Ten fingers, right? What, what, what would that be? <laughs> Zero, one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all right? Now, let's look at uh, if we have um, binary. And I want to have, in this case, let's say four. Four binary bits, right? And remember, if I have four, I have how many different combinations of that? 16, right? So 2 to the 4 is going to be equal to 16 different ones. We're going to call this one hexadecimal, all right? Or simply hex. So if we have, you know, you, you could see the example up there, 00011011. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. If I were to represent this in binary, what do you think this would be? Zero, 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 zero. If I were to represent this as uh, binary, what do you think it would be? All right, zero, 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 one. How about two? Zero, zero, one, zero. You not could see how that would continue on, right? Yes, no, okay. So what I want you to do is I do this often in class. Um, um, we'll just stop for a moment because uh, you pretty much have absorbed everything you can in the last 25 minutes. And uh, you're going to turn to your neighbor. And between the two of you, you're going to talk. 
and you're going to create a chart where you're going to fill in all the decimal numbers and all the binary representations of that and uh, do it from decimal uh, 0 to 15. How about that? All right? We'll come back in a few minutes. All right, we're coming back. And uh, just to get a flavor of what you guys, use guys in the true sense of uh, northerner, northerner. Uh, what would six be in binary? Zero, one, one, zero. Uh, and uh, even though I don't have room on this, if I were to do uh, 15, what was that? One, 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 okay, and that's all binary. Sometimes when we talk about binary, we'll put a little two subscript there. And sometimes when we talk about uh, decimal, we'll put a little 10 subscript there. There's one other um, uh, base that we're going to worry about, worry about, and that's hexadecimal. Remember I said hexadecimal is a special, uh, special um, situation where you put four of the binary bits together. And the interesting uh, thing you do about this, we're going to see this later. This is going to be 0x0. Zero 0x zero. Zero means this is a hexadecimal digit, and 0 is the value. 0x1, zero 0x2, zero blah, blah, blah. Here's 0x6. As you can imagine, if I get down to the bottom, 0 hex. 9, and this is to distinguish it as a hexadecimal digit. And where it gets interesting is if we're looking at a 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, and specifically, you know, we want a single digit to be represented in hex. And so what they do is they just call this 0 hex A, 0 hex B, 0 hex C, 0 hex D, 0 hex E, and 0 hex F. Now later on we're going to see situations where we might want to say something like uh, 0 hex um, F1, for example. And so that means F is the representation of 15. Oh, by the way, which is the representation of what in binary? 1111, right? 15, 0, hex F, 1111. And then um, this 1 over here represents, it's in hexadecimal, so what's the representation in binary for that 1 in hexadecimal? Zero, 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 0001, right? So the whole representation of that would be binary 1111001. And this is binary. And that's how we're going to use these numbers to, to put them together and to use them um, for our calculations a little bit later. And the reason I bring that up is because when we start to do some programming, we're going to actually have to use something that's 8 bits wide and represent it, not have to worry about 1011101. Did I do 8? Something like that. But it's a lot easier to put it in hexadecimal. All right, let's, uh, let's fast forward now to basic logic gates. So how many of you have had logic gates before? Well, a couple of you, all right? So the rest of you are going to have to learn this. This is easy, right? We're going to be working with not, or, and. So the logic aspect of this is not, and each one of these inputs, by the way, is uh, a single bit. So let's take a look at that one over there. A is not. Oh, A is fed into a not, and the result is not A. So the natural logic sense of this would be as follows. 
and my glasses are over there, so I'm going to be really blind as I do this. If you input a, a uh, this is going to be the input is A and the output is A with a bar over it, which we call not. Can you tell that's an A? Good. <laughs> if I input a zero into my gate, what do you think the output's going to be? One, because it's the opposite of it, the not of it. And if I input a one, what do you think the output is going to be? Zero, all right? This is kind of, oops, this is kind of, well, logical. Isn't that kind of funny? Yeah, all right. So going back on this, if we have a AND gate, an AND gate, there it is right there. It's going to be represented in this table AB. <coughs> so if I have an A of a value 0 and a B of the value of 0, A and B will be 1 if both A and B is 1. So the result of this operation here is, is AB 0 or 1? 0. And let's give all the possibilities. Remember, we have two bits. So in this case, A and B is 0, A and B is 0, and A and B is 1. So in this case, the operation of the AND gate, AB, is 1 if both A and B are 1. In the same way, we have an OR gate, which means that the operation of A or B, and this is, they use a plus sign for this, but you actually should uh, equate this as the OR gate. And again, since we have uh, two binary digits, we have four different combinations. So this operation over here will be one if A or B is equal to 1. So uh, in this case, 0 or 0 is? 0 or 1 is? 1. 1 or 0 is? And 1 or 1 is? 1. And this is the basic objective of these gates. Now, keeping in mind that there are a couple other ones here, this is nothing more than a NOR gate followed by a NOT gate. This is an AND gate followed by a NOT gate. So if you have this up here, if this is uh, my option of A, B, and this is how we would draw it. Did we draw it up there correctly? Yes, we did. A, B, NOT, what do you think this would be? This would be 1, 1, 1, 0. So basically we take the operation of the AND gate and we just invert it, kind of like using over here at the NOT gates. And in the same way, if we, uh, if we were doing a NOT OR or a NOR, and just so it's not all that confusing, I'm going to get rid of this line right there. The uh, operation of the NOR gate would be 1, 0, 0, 0, because we're just taking the result of the OR and we're nodding it. Easy enough? Now we have, uh, I've already alluded to how we uh, work with uh, uh, binary numbers. And so, by the way, this is, uh, this is a topic you're going to go into in great detail next semester when you take ECGR 2181, which is Introduction to uh, Digital Logic or Digital Logic Systems 1. And there is a representation in decimal. I've already talked about the representation in binary. And you know, keeping in mind the, uh, the example that I said, uh, we had 15 
which is in decimal, which was equivalent to 1111 in binary. Well, if you look at this, that first binary digit actually represents 2 to the 4th, or I'm sorry, 2 to the 3rd, which is equivalent to 8 in decimal. This next one right here is equivalent to 2 to the 2nd, which is 4. This next one is equivalent to 2 to the 1st, which is the value of 2. And this next one here is 2 to the 0th, which is 1. And if you add these all up together, it gets to be 15 decimal. Now, when we, when we uh, go a little bit further and have some operations, I showed a number over there which was hexadecimal F1, which, uh, which was nothing more than uh, breaking out each one of those binary digits and making a longer binary number. So let's see if I have some, i show an example here. Oh, so we have a good example here. So let's say I'm working with eight decimal digits, right? And so, I'm sorry, eight uh, uh, binary digits. So eight binary digits. Here's the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. So we're going to go up to this. Now, keep in mind that us computer people, we always start counting at zero. So you notice that this is 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, 2 to the 4, 2 to the 5, right? So if I have the following, if I have a value, and well, let's take a look at that one over there. I said it was 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Right now, turn to your neighbor and tell me what is this in decimal, all right? We are back and let's take a look at this. So, by the way, I've identified this as 0xf1, this is the hexadecimal number, and I've identified this as the binary 1111 zero 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 one and this is uh, binary so it'll be the uh, subscript two which means that this is also the decimal number 241 I'll buy this and oh notice that it's an odd number right 241 odd that's because we have a, a one all the way in this bit right here so that will always identify if it's odd or even. So, oh, here's a decimal number 17. What would be the binary representation of decimal number 17? All right, so 0, 16, 0 for this, 17. That was an easy one, right? So if I were to represent this in hexadecimal, well, I want to stick with 8 bits, so I would be 0, 0, oopsies. Let's do binary first. So I would do this as 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and that's binary. All right, so I would pad some extra zeros on the front here. And then this would be equivalent to what value in... Uh, in hexadecimal? Zero hex, one, one. All right? Because what we do is we group these four together and then we group these four together. And uh, this pretty much tells you what to do. All right? These are in the notes so you can uh, check out all this later. So, uh, go ahead and convert the number uh, uh, 29 from decimal to binary. Go ahead and spend a minute or two to do that. 
So I saw that all y'all are done. So uh, the answer is? Okay, somebody said zero, one, one, zero. But there's other stuff. Well, let's just show the uh, example of uh, how this would be. One, 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 zero, one. All right? So you could do this by repeated subtraction. Easy enough. Now I can go even more practice, but uh, feel free to go ahead and do this on your own. Um, and uh, to do all this practice on your own, uh, here's an example. You could do it with 70 and you could do it with uh, 255. Question? Um, on that last one, when you convert it in the hex and you have 0001 and then 1101, since 001 is uh, the number one and the second one would be D, does the letter come before the number? Mm, good question. So if I were to pad this with 00 at the front, this would be, then you would group this followed by this. So in this example, this would be 0 hex 1 D. All right, that answers your question. Because, you know, what, this is the first part of the number. This is the second part of the number. You don't need to sort, you know, put the letter first. Because otherwise it would be a different number, right? All right, lots of practice. Uh, and I think I've pretty much showed you you can go from hex to binary and binary to hex really easily. You know, we've been only working with up to eight bits, but sometimes these uh, numbers get really big. I don't want to go into that or that. All right, so I will go into this. Um, you're going to see examples in this class where you will have... Uh, Elect electronics packaging. And so uh, um, let's quick go to uh, a picture. This is the board that you're going to be working with in class. Now one thing I want you to observe is that, oh, here's a part right here. And it looks like it's soldered, in other words, uh, mechanically um, welded to the surface with some metal-y type stuff. And this one looks like it has little legs on it and you push it in this socket. And then there's some other parts here that look like they're, um, again, soldered to the surface. And what it is is that there are some packages which are called dual inline that have holes. These are um, common for older designs because it's a lot easier to manufacture boards like this if you only have to solder it on the surface. And actually that's something that you'll learn, computer engineers, you'll learn this later in uh, embedded systems. Those of you in uh, electrical engineering, you're gonna wish you took embedded systems, right? And by the way, uh, these ones that you do on the surface, could be on one side, we call those dual flat packs, or it could be on all four sides. These are called quad flat packs, or they could have these little balls of solder on the bottom of the part. These are called ball grid array. In fact, these are really popular uh, for um, devices like, like this Apple Watch because you don't have very much space to put all your parts. And so, as you can imagine, if you have the electrical connections to the silicon part inside, if you have these electrical connections on the side, you're taking up a lot of space on the side. Whereas if you do it on the bottom, then you have what's called a ball grid array, and it doesn't take so much space on the sides. Uh, I think I had some comments here. Um, packages have metal leads which allow you con to connect between um, these parts. And uh, they're all connected to each other with copper traces on the printed circuit board. So if you look really carefully on this board, and you're going to have these boards in your hands in just a couple of minutes, 
you'll have all the way on the bottom there, or all the way on the surface there, you'll have them uh, together. So assignment number one, and this is the last slide I have, assignment number one is going to be downloading and installing the uh, tool to be able to run the labs that we're going to do for the rest of the semester. Um, oh, and then assignment number two is you're going to blink LEDs. Ooh, exciting, huh? And assignment number three is you're going to breadboard up a switch and an LED in addition to using the LED and switch on the board itself. And then assignment number four is that you're going to hook up a, uh, um, a bunch of switches and a speaker and then you're going to play some tunes like the, uh, uh, the um, Empire Death March or the Mario tune or some, some, uh, some beautiful classical music. It's the theme from uh, 2001 uh, Space Odyssey, which is, I think, called also um, Zusarathan Sprecht or something like that. Yeah, whatever, something like that. <laughs> It's for, it's for cultured people like you. I'm not cultured, so I can't, I, you know, I can't admit that, right? So um, what you're going to see is on your machine, you're going to load this tool right here called Code Composer Studio, which is, by the way, by the manufacturer Texas Instruments. So Texas Instruments makes the board and uh, of course this free software that we're going to use. The software is called an Integrated Development Environment, IDE. And what you do is you can use this Integrated Development Environment to write code and download it to your board. And I'm going to talk about this in a lot more detail in the next class. But it also gives you the start to writing this code, and, and the tools are easy to use so you can download it quickly, all right? That's all I have for lecture for this class.